God's ways are so far above our ways as the heavens are above the earth. The synthesis of the gospel is Jesus himself at the end, forever. You and I will be in heaven or hell, period. Heavenly Father, we come in Jesus' name to consider the great mystery of the Catholic family, great mystery of holiness. We ask you to grant us the grace to delve into this mystery. We ask you to open our minds and hearts that we might come to appreciate the family, the sacrament of holy matrimony. For we know that this is the basic building block of all society. And if the family is sick, society is sick. And so we ask you in Jesus' name to grant us grace, to grant us grace to know and to love this great mystery of the Catholic family. And together we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Happy are you who fear the Lord, who walk in his ways. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the recesses of your home, your children like olive plants around your table. Behold, thus is the man blessed, who fears the Lord. Those words from the psalm point toward the great holiness, the great gift uh, of the family. I, I've been asked to talk about the family this weekend, and so I'm going to break it down into six talks. Uh, the first one this evening will be on the nature and mission of the Catholic family. Uh, the next one will be on sex, of all things. Sex, sacred, not evil. Now that's an enormously relevant and necessary topic. Very few priests, I believe, talk about it. Uh, maybe they don't want to, they're uncomfortable with it, they don't think it's relevant, I'm not sure. But it is important, uh, and I can tell you, I can tell you how important it is by how messed up society is, right? You, I mean, you can deduce that. You know the kind of problems we have in that area in our society. Um, but it, it's sacred. It's not dirty. It's not evil. It's not something bad. The contrary. It's sacred. The third talk will be on the sanctity of human life. That will be based mostly on the encyclical Humanae Vitae of Pope Paul VI. The sanctity of human life. Human life is sacred from the moment of conception to the last moment of natural life. Contemporary attacks on the family will be the fourth talk, and there are many of them. Not the least of which, by the way, is the current tidal wave of scandals in the church. The attacks on the priesthood from within and from without, that's an attack on the family. You know why? Because the sanctification of the family is very much dependent upon the ministry of priests. I'll tell you what's happened. By my own experience, when I traveled with a, a man or men to help me, they said I was a homosexual. When I travel with a woman to help me, they say it must be his mistress. God forbid I should ever travel with young people or children or 
God knows what they think. I live with two Chesapeake Bay Retrievers. You know what? I don't care what they think. Doesn't make a bit of difference to me what they think. But that's how absurd it is. And I'll tell you, I, you know, I try to be treat it lightly, and we've got to laugh about it a little bit, but it's tragic. Absolutely tragic. Think about this for a minute. Now, how many of you were here last summer when I was here? Oh, quite a few of you. For, for the Immortal Combat, the, the series we did right here on spiritual warfare. Think what's happened. Now remember, I did that in July last year. Think what's happened since then. Been one heck of a year, hasn't it? Who would have known a couple months later? Less than two months later, September 11th. Then a tidal wave of scandals in the church, outside of the church. Enron, WorldCom, Arthur Anderson, and who knows what's next. Of all the priests who helped me advance toward priesthood, of all of them, there's only one left who isn't dead or permanently expelled from the priesthood. Only one left. He celebrates his 50th anniversary of ordination next week. I'll preach the homily at the Mass. I could tell you the names, the very prominent names, of some wonderful priests. My mother sent me a newspaper clipping last week. She called me first to tell me about it. Her voice was trembling on the phone. The headline from the diocesan newspaper, my home diocese, Albany, New York. Seven priests removed from ministry forever. That was the headline, forever. Forever. You cannot appreciate what that means unless you understand what a priest is and what he means to your family. Contemporary attacks on the family. That'll be number four. Number five, love equals sacrifice. A lot of you have heard me say that before. Love is the cross, and the cross is love. Most of you are married. You know about that. You know that after the honeymoon, it's sacrifice. Hmm? You know, one day you wake up, bleary-eyed look over and exclaim, Ah! What have I done? You're married, bozo. <laughs> Too late now. But that's when love begins to mature. Tested love is true love. And so after the hormone stage and the emotion stage and the honeymoon stage passes, authentic love matures. And in the end, it equals sacrifice. That's the fifth talk. And then at the end, we'll have a question and answer. We'll uh, probably pass around some notepads or something and write some brief questions that you want to ask me concerning the topic, you know, on, on this discussion on the family. I, I entitled it The Catholic Family Garden of Holiness. And the Catholic family is exactly that, or should be that, a garden of holiness. 
Many of you have heard me give a talk on the Blessed Mother on the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and I talk about the Immaculate Heart of Mary in the context of a garden, a holy garden. The Catholic family is a garden of holiness. The Catholic family is a place set aside for the planting and the nurturing and the bringing to fruition of virtue. All virtues should be planted, nurtured, cultivated, and brought to fruition in the garden of the Catholic family, a garden of holiness. I wonder, just think about this for a minute. Now, I know that you folks are not your average Catholic. You're not. Um, you may think you are, but you're not. Uh, you d I know you don't think of yourself this way, but you're the cream of the crop. You really are. You're the pillars of the church. You're the people who century in and century out keep the church going. You are the people who will still be here when this rash of scandals blows away, you'll still be standing. Not going to shake you. Oh, it shakes our faith a little bit. We struggle with this mess. I do. Well, you're going to be here. When the storm blows itself out, you're going to be here. You're rock solid. I know that. But you need to be confirmed in your faith just like I do. I, I know I can't tell you anything new, but what I can do is confirm you in what you already have, convince you that you haven't made a mistake, that the faith of our fathers is the faith indeed. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And now we need to be stronger than ever. We need strong families. All vocations come from the family. Vocations are the fruit that comes from the garden of holiness, Catholic family. Whether it's vo vocations to marriage, vocations to the priesthood, vocations to religious life, all vocations flow from the family. If the family is not what it should be, individuals will be deformed, stunted, blighted. Do you remember what happened when Jesus and the disciples were walking through the countryside and Jesus wanted to take some figs from the fig tree and there weren't any and he cursed the fig tree? They said, well, let, let us, let us uh, put some manure on it and, and cultivate it a little bit and give it a chance. Wait, wait a while. You know, it, it might bear fruit, yeah? He came back by and it hadn't borne fruit. What did he do? He cursed it, withered and died. Is your family bearing fruit. Now when I ask you that question, don't panic. Because everybody I know, every good Catholic family that I know, has some members who aren't practicing the faith. I'm, I'm not talking about that. Don't, don't panic when I say that. Most people do. You know, they say, oh, uh-oh. Oh. I'm the, uh, you know, I'm the cursed fig tree. No. <laughs> no figgy. Don't worry. You're all right. Sometimes you can do everything right. And it looks like you've failed. It's not over yet, though. You know, God's not finished with your children or your grandchildren. Just yet. You have time. And so long as there's time, there's hope. God can do more in a minute than a thousand years of mere human effort. And so don't despair. Don't worry. 
But don't be foolish either. Get to work. Get to work and pray. The sacrament of matrimony, of course, is the basis for the, the family. That's where holy families come from. Matrimony is a, a sacrament. It's an interesting sacrament. It's the only sacrament where the recipients of the sacrament are the ministers of the sacrament. Did you know that? Did most of you know that? Some of you know that. How many of you have studied the Catechism of the Catholic Church? Seriously. See, now I'm talking to the pillars of the church here. And, and you are. And I respect you for that. But you know what? You better get to work. Because as much as I love you, if you don't study the Catechism, now here's my Walmart version of it. I got this in Walmart for three ninety-five. They had an enormous mountain of them in Walmart, of all places. It says seven ninety-nine on the back. I got it for three ninety-five. I know how to shop. <laughs> now, if you don't have a copy of this, shame on you. But you say, but I'm too old, Father. How old are you, 90? I have men and women, many of them in their 80s, that went through my entire course on the Catechism of the Catholic Church. They sat there personally through all 48 hours of it and the 12 hours of question and answer when I filmed it back in 1996. Countless more have watched it on television or through the videotapes, parishes, adult education groups in parishes, little groups meeting in somebody's home, studying the catechism. Why should you study the catechism of the Catholic Church? Because basically it's the truth. What's the truth? The truth is Jesus. Jesus is the truth. Do you think we should study Jesus? Do you, think, do you think you should know the person you love? Yeah. I mean, it's absurd to say, I love somebody and not to, you don't want to know anything about them. Silly. Jesus is the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You, you've got to get to know Jesus. You've got to get to know the Lord. And one of the best ways to do it is to study the faith. Because the substance of the faith is Jesus Christ, the truth. Study it, learn it, interiorize it, and then live it. And you'll be a force. St. Thomas Aquinas used to say, an error in the beginning is an error indeed. I think the biggest error that we make in families and I think it's built into the system. I, I, I can't criticize it too much. It's just a fact of life. When you're younger, you have other things on your mind. Maybe starting a career, uh, you're ambitious, uh, whatever it is. And you do not take your faith that seriously. You do not spend... I can, I can tell you how you gauge it. On an average day... How much time do you dedicate to prayer? Now, I know you don't have that much time. You've got to work. You've got to do all kinds of things. You're not nuns or monks. You're not supposed to be. You're lay people. But ask yourself an honest question. Out of 24 hours in a day, do I give the Lord at least 30 minutes? How about 15? You've got to do at least that much. You know what's going to happen if you don't do at least that much? Nothing's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. You're going to go downhill. There are no planes in the spiritual life. You go up or you go down. It's a very steep hill. You climb or you roll back down. No planes, no flat places in the spiritual life. The clock is ticking. About a month ago, well, June 11th, I remember the date when I was laying on that table and the guy said, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do for you. 
I didn't panic, but I got more serious than usual. <laughs> you know what I mean. Oh, yeah, I packed my suitcase. I gathered up my medical records. I went off to do what I had to do. And uh, that morning, you know, I, got, I went to bed, got in about 10 o'clock at night, it went to my friend's house, slept there, didn't sleep much that night. Um, the next, it was a busy day. I had this appointment scheduled with the cardiologist and then the surgeon, and, uh, you know, I was going to have the, sur the surgery then, the next morning. You know what the first thing I did was on that, um, I guess it was a Thursday morning? I said, uh, I want to go to confession. I went to the local parish, waylaid the priest in the courtyard, said, Father, I'd like to go to confession. And I told him I was about to have serious surgery. And I said, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And then he gave me anointing of the sick. And, it, and then everything went better from that point on. I scurried around. I had to finish writing my will. Then I had my doctor meetings. But you know what I did first. Like I said last year, if you can't even get to the battlefield, how are you going to fight the fight? If you're not in a state of grace, now I was in a state of grace, by the way, but I went to confession anyway. Why? Didn't want to take no chances. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> hey, uh, my friend the nurse was, was uh, trying to lighten things up all day, and she said, well, Father, <laughs> she said, when you wake up, you'll see me over you saying, it's over, Father, everything's all right now. You get serious when you're facing that stuff. If we could be serious every day of our life, when the last day of our life came along, it'd go a lot easier on us. It really would. Well, I have some advice for you. Right here and right now, get serious. When I stood up here last year, one year ago, Who among us would have thought what would transpire in that year between then and now? God help us. September 11th? My dad died a few days before that. I buried my father on September 11th, by the way. I flew down to Los Angeles from San Francisco September 10th. met my superior. We went, stayed in a motel, got up 5 o'clock in the morning to celebrate Mass. My office manager called me about 5.30 Pacific time and said, turn on the television, something horrible is going on. And I saw the events live. This last year has been unbelievable. Now, I told you to get serious last year. And I'm telling you again, get serious. Get serious in your personal life. Get serious in your family life. Because God only knows what's going to happen in this coming year. And it's not going to get any better until it gets a lot worse. In the last year, we've had September 11th, we've had Enron, we've had WorldCom, we've had Arthur Anderson. What's next? The world is coming apart at the seams. Our society is unraveling. The decline in the stock market is unnerving. I have friends who've lost millions this past year. I wonder what will happen 
in the coming year. What is the mission of the Catholic family? The mission of the Catholic family can be no different than the mission of the Redeemer. What is the mission of the Redeemer? Redemption. Why did Jesus come? To save the world. The mission of the family is sanctification. The sanctification of the members of the family is the mission of the family. And then the members of the family go out into the world and set about the work of sanctifying that world. Jesus said and says, the servant is no better than his master. Where I am there, my servant will be. Redemption. Sanctification. The bottom line is this, souls, period. End of story. You can simplify it. We don't have to complicate a simple thing. Simplify a complicated thing, but this is a simple thing. Tell it simply. Why are we here? To become holy. What is the purpose of the family? That the members of the family might become holy. Why? Because that is the mission of Christ. But you cannot do until you are. There's an axiom in met metaphysics. Being precedes doing. Being precedes doing. Jesus is God and Son of God. A divine person who assumed a human nature. And then through that perfectly holy human nature, he sanctified the world. He made it holy. That is our mission. And if you are doing anything other than that as the overall objective of your life, you're wasting your time. You really are. If the objective of our life is to make as much money as we can, that's a great deception. That's a great waste of time for me and for you. You know, if I come to the end and stand before God, do you think God is going to ask for a set of audited financial statements? Not from Arthur Anderson, he won't. <laughs> By the way, I had a job offer from Arthur Anderson when I was right out of college. I'm glad I didn't take it. I could be a partner right now <laughs> with all my stock and my pension plan worthless. God help us, the poor people. We're losing confidence in the government. We're losing confidence in corporate America. Uh, I've lost confidence in the medical system, the health care system. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to panic about it, but... Uh, you know, I'm interviewing lawyers now. Yeah, I hate to do that, but you know what? <laughs> there are hospitals and doctors, just as there are other professionals, other people, who are doing unethical and immoral things for money. Uh, just like creative accounting can result in a deceptive presentation of the financial situation of a corporation. Take somebody like me, I'm 55. You know, that, that's an interesting age, right? 55. Now, I'm a senior cer citizen, you know, in certain circles now, 55. My dad died of coronary artery disease, the onset of which was when he was about 55. I don't eat right. I don't exercise anymore. I have way too much stress in my life. So when the doctor said, look, you need a triple bypass, I was shocked but not surprised. And so I would have gone right through it had I not been the beneficiary of a lot of prayers. I'm sure of that. 
I didn't go to the other state to get a second opinion. I went to have the surgery. I was just fortunate that they checked everything out first. There is decadence every place you look. I can't get through a day without this much aggravation. I don't know about you. I get my telephone bill. It's wrong. <laughs> I get a credit card bill. Who did that? <laughs> you go to the doctor. Nobody knows. I got three board certified cardiologists over here saying I'm on the edge of death. I got three board certified cardiologists over here say, oh, you're the picture of health. <laughs> What'd I do? Flip a coin? <laughs> I'll guarantee you, all of the people in corporate America, the medical profession, the legal profession, the priesthood, whatever, who are skipping and dancing down the wrong road aren't living the values that a Catholic and Christian family taught them or should have taught them. An error in the beginning is an error indeed, as St. Thomas said. My brothers and sisters, you and I have an awesome responsibility. You've got to form your children and your grandchildren. That's a daunting task. Uh, look at the world we live in. It's corrupt. Every place you look, it is sick. It is decadent. But you can't become bitter and cynical and negative because that doesn't work. You have to transcend that. You have to have confidence. You have to have courage. You have to have every virtue. And those virtues are initially cultivated in the Catholic family, a garden, a garden of holiness. You need to do that. Mom, Dad, Grandma, Grandpa, you're awesome. You're tremendous. You are called to a mighty, dignified, and noble undertaking the sanctification of your family. And I'm called to sanctify all of you. And boy, don't you think that doesn't scare the tar out of me. <laughs> I might have to answer for your souls. Oh, I will. I'll guarantee you I will. I'm going to have to stand before Jesus and explain why some of you slipped through my fingers because of my negligence, because of my worldliness, because of my lack of focus, because I didn't shed enough blood, sweat, and tears, because I wasn't assiduous enough in prayer and penance, because I wasn't a good soldier staying at my post on the battle line when my mission demanded it of me, when I wanted to take my ease. It's an awesome responsibility for me and for you. Time is short. I'm not talking about the end of the world. I know nothing about that. I am talking about an escalation an intensification of things in the world. And if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you know I'm right. Look at the last year since we've been together. What's transpired? Probably some of us didn't make it through this year. God only knows uh, I've had several points during this year where I didn't think I could go on another step. It, it, it's like, being, it's like a, a boxer being in a fight. I feel like I fought a 15-round fight this past year 
with someone way out of my class, and I took a real fearsome beating. I have been engaged in lawsuits, in medical fiascos. I have been accused of things that you wouldn't believe. I have spent $100,000 in legal and medical bills in the last 90 days. I don't have that much money. And it's going to take me a while to get out of that mess. I will. I will. 90 days. And I didn't have the stinking surgery. <laughs> It'd be another 350 to 500,000 if I had. Now I wonder how many other poor souls have had it. When I was talking to the FBI agent, in that region about it. I reminded them that four to seven percent of people who have triple bypasses die within 90 days. I wonder how many unnecessary surgeries were done and I wonder how many people are in that four to seven percent. I wonder how many second degree murder charges we could bring because somebody was greedy. Across the board, we live in a sick, depraved, immoral, unethical society. And it is our fault. It is the fault of Catholics and Catholic families because we have failed to be as holy as we are called to be. We get what we deserve. My next door neighbor yesterday we were having a glass of iced tea together, and he had open-heart surgery a couple years ago, and we were comparing bills. <laughs> Mine was small, and his was big. And he was lamenting the fact that he remembered the days where when a woman could deliver a baby and it cost 50 bucks. Or you could spend a week in the hospital for about 300 <laughs> it, it, it's amazing that in my lifetime we've gone from that to $75 for an aspirin on your hospital bill. Well, they have to pay a pharmacist, they say, etc., etc. There's something wrong. There's something very, very wrong. Well, what do we do? Just complain about it or do we do something about it? We do something about it. And it starts in the family. The family. The family is being undermined, ridiculed, mocked. Women and men tell me all over the country that if they have more than two children, uh, they begin to wonder if they're in communist China because people criticize them. Tomorrow, most of the day will be spent on topics concerning life, the sanctity of human life. I blame an awful lot of what we have on the self-centeredness that was fostered, promoted, and perpetuated through a contraceptive mentality. We became focused on self, sexually, Financially, in every other way, followed. If you're centered on yourself, you're going to unravel. You're going to close in on yourself. And then society will do the same. But what is society if it is not a community of individuals? And if all those individuals are empty, cold, and self-centered, then what can we expect but disaster? Whenever we talk this way, we open ourselves to criticism. Oh, he's negative. He's bitter. He's cynical. He's pessimistic. No. I am realistic. It is the truth. And if you and I don't begin in earnest, then we will live to see our children and grandchildren inherit a legacy of emptiness 
that will be absolutely terrifying. The Catholic family has to have a resurgence. We have to become extremely serious about safeguarding the integrity and the sanctity of our family. Now, I have never been a parish priest, but if I were a parish priest, and I don't have the gifts for it, I admit, but if anything threatened my parish, bad teaching, a bad teacher, some kind of immorality, God help it. Because metaphorically speaking, I'd rip it limb from limb. It wouldn't get far in my bellywick. And in the family, you have to be just as assiduous in maintaining an environment that is wholesome and holy. And I know it's not easy, and it takes some ingenuity. And you don't want to be a, a Hitler about it. You don't want to be a dictator about it. You don't want to alienate your children. But you have to be strong. And you have to be clear-headed. Soft-hearted, yes but not soft-headed. You've got to be strong as parents and as spouses. In the end, you'll suffer. You'll suffer. You don't believe me, then tomorrow or the next day when you go home, announce to your family that each evening after supper, you're going to pray the family rosary. And if you don't think you'll suffer, <laughs> watch what happens. And if you don't get it right away, wait a week or a month and see how many contrivances arise, rise their ugly heads to end the little ro rosary gathering. Some of you have heard me tell the story about my great-grandfather, the French-Canadian one on my mother's side. Great-grandfather was a carpenter. And um, we'd go up and visit him once in a while. He was a very powerfully built man, but not big. Short, about five foot seven, high and wide at the shoulder. And every evening, without fail, for his entire married life, which spanned 65 years before he passed on, he led his family in the family rosary great-grandfather would kneel on a chair and there he had he was a carpenter and he carved a beautiful statue out of wood hardwood of the Blessed Mother of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and Saint Joseph and they were indented into the wall and he would kneel down on that chair and the whole family would kneel behind behind him and great-grandfather would lead the whole family young and old, in the family rosary. You did not know great-grandfather. I only knew him as a small boy. But you couldn't imagine to have announced to great-grandfather, I don't feel like doing it tonight. You have no idea what that would have elicited. For great-grandfather was a formidable man even in his old age. When the children and the grandchildren came to visit, didn't make any difference. Some of them had been in the Marines. Some of them came home in the Marine uniforms. Every one of them in their Marine uniforms knelt down and said the family rosary. Or they didn't want to reckon with great-grandfather. That's a family. That's a Catholic family. We have a crisis in the family. We have a crisis of manhood. A lot of men don't know what it means to be men anymore. They are weak in the knees, got no moral backbone, interested in all kinds of sundry and irrelevant things, don't have a clue that their main function is the sanctification of their family, their wife, and their children. And the women? What's your job? I think women are better at it than men. They always have been. But the women, their job? Sanctify the husband and the children. The children, what's their job? Sanctify the parents. 
They usually do it by torturing them. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not really. Not really. But no, everybody has a job. And the job is the same. Holiness. Sanctification of the family. You to provide an environment where virtue flourishes. That means an environment where impurity has no place. That means a wholesome environment. That means an open environment. That means an environment where your children can approach you. Not in fear, but in openness and in love. You know, it's a great art to balance justice and mercy. That's what God does. He's a God of justice, but he's also a God of mercy, and in the end, mercy triumphs over justice. Be soft-hearted. You were young once. You know what it was like. If you've forgotten, recall. Don't be too tough on them, but don't be soft-headed. They want to do things that you know from your own experience, you know can lead to trouble, don't be afraid to say no. My mother, every now and then, reminisces about a day not too long after when I got out of the Army, 1970, in the early spring. No, it wasn't the spring. No, it was later. It was in the fall of 1970. And my little sister had just turned 14 and entered high school. And she asked my mother, starting on Monday, if she could go to the football game Friday night. And my mother said, yes, you can go to the football game, but you can't go in a car. I don't want you going in a car with older kids. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know how it is, kept it up and kept it up. Friday morning, my mother left for work, as usual, at 6.30. Again, I want to go to the football game. I want to go with my friends. My mother said, no, you can go to the game, but not in a car. If you go in a car, something terrible will happen. My little sister snuck off in the car with her friends. And on the way home from the game, they were all killed. Except the driver. He had to live with it for the rest of his life. Four of them, 14 to 16, snuffed out. Now my mother had said no, because she had a sense that only a mother can have. There was a reason for it. God has his reasons that reason cannot fathom. Parents, be loving, but be strong. You don't want to ever be caught in the position like the woman who went to Padre Pio, the great saint, went to confession, knelt down, and she couldn't even get the first word out. He leaped up and chased her out of the confessional. She was very much indignant about it, came back later and chastised him, said, why did you chase me out of the confession like, confessional like that? He said, because when you knelt down, I had a vision of your three children, every one of whom is in hell because of your negligence and permissiveness. Now confess and be forgiven. Brothers and sisters, it is an awesome, enormous dignity to be a husband, wife, member of a family, remembering that the family is a microcosm of the church and that the family is the domestic church. The first line of catechesis it is where that garden of holiness has to be planted. It's where we nurture the seeds of virtue, where those seeds flourish.
and bear fruit, where the members of that family go out into society and enrich it, strengthen it, ennoble it. That's the family. That's the Catholic family. And if you want to know why the family is unraveling, I can point to last summer's conference. Spiritual warfare. The enemy is a tactician. Strike the family, you strike at all of society. Undermine the family, you undermine all of society. Let's be resolved, family. Let's be resolved, no matter how young or old we are, to enter into this battle for the family with all our heart, mind, and strength. Because I promise you, if you do that, if you do it faithfully, in a little while, a very little while, sooner than you think, you and I are going to be standing before God, and he's going to smile at you, and you're going to hear these words, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master's house. God bless you.